everybody. Good afternoon, Yashri. Uh, it's a pleasure to interview you today. Um, but first of all, I would like to present myself as the interviewer. Um, so I am used to be a former delegate and I was in the intellectual property office. And at this uh, capacity, I was the Swiss, the Swiss negotiator in the Uruguay round. And uh, I had the pleasure to meet, I mean, uh, Yashri Water. Um, after that, I joined the WTO Secretariat in the year of 2000. And now I work as an independent IP counsel. Um, let me introduce you now, Yashri. Yashri was the Indian negotiator of trips in the Uruguay round with me as a Swiss negotiator. We became colleagues in the intellectual property division of the WTO Secretariat. And both of us was recruited by the, in, the uh, director, Adrian Oten, who was you know, one of the um, participants in the negotiations of the Treats of Gaiman. So Jasri is now engaged in part-time consulting and she is also teaching in um, India United States and Switzerland. So the objective I think is important is that we would like to have an exchange of views on a range of very specific issues relevant to the Minister Conference 12 uh, decision on the TRIPS agreement. Um, the basis, I mean, of what we are discussing is the decision which is contained in document W slash MIN Ministerial 22 W 15 Ref 1 of 17 June 2022. So this is important to get this paper as the basis of our exchange of views. Um, now I will go straight to the the, the, the core of this uh, interview is that um, there is um, a proposal for a waiver put forward by India uh, and South Africa, supported by many countries, and which was requesting the waiver. Waiver means derogation to the obligations to the TRIPS agreement. A waiver on a very wide set of you know uh, disciplines and most of uh, of them most important is about patterns and uh, test data etc uh, in the area of um, public health it was not specifically said for public health it was across the board so uh, this is the the first um, initiative which triggered a lot of reactions and one of the reaction is the opposition of mostly industrialized countries and it has been a long process where you have you know for the ministerial conference uh, a new proposal of quad quad mean quadrilateral group of countries uh, which are negotiating and which have proposed a proposal and this quad is not as we used to, to think that it was industrialized countries, but it was a set of industrialized countries and developing countries. So um, the work was quite intense and, um, and the, on the 17th of June, uh, there was a decision. So I would like to give the floor to Yashri to describe the content of this ministerial decision as it is now. I give you the floor, Yashwe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tulan. Uh, just to inform everyone that now the draft ministerial decisions of 17th June have been made final, and there is a final text, including uh, on trips. All the outcomes are final documents now, and WT, uh, WT slash min 22 slash 30 or WT slash L slash 1141 is the final document issued yesterday. Now, uh, I would like to start with why did the, uh, why did India and South Africa 
demand a waiver of the TRIPS provisions initially in October 2020, revised in May 2021. And why did the others, uh, more than 60 or so, uh, developing country members of the WTO, uh, including the LDC group, the ACP group, the African group, and so on, uh, support this uh, waiver uh, proposal? The, the argument made at that time was that the existing TRIPS flexibilities are not adequate to deal with a pandemic like COVID-19 uh, because compulsory licensing is not easy to do, particularly compulsory licensing for exports, which uh, was decided uh, uh, in 2003 as a waiver of decision first and then incorporated into the TRIPS agreement as an amendment. So all these, all these procedures which are existing in the TRIPS agreement on compulsory licensing and compulsory licensing for exports are not adequate. And therefore it is necessary to have a full waiver of all the provisions of about 40 articles of the TRIPS agreement so uh, that it's easy for countries in need in the developing world to produce their own vaccines. That was the argument given. Now, from 20 uh, uh, October to uh, very recently, till the decision was made, several questions were, uh, were put to the proponents as to how uh, the waiver could help if they did not really have the cooperation of the right owner to give the know-how, the trade secrets and so on, particularly with respect to complex products such as vaccines, because these are very difficult to do without the cooperation of the right holder. Many of these questions were not really answered, but a lot of discussion took place from, uh, from public records really, on, uh, on the difficulties of using a compulsory license. And uh, the quadrilateral process that Tulan referred to, which was between the EU, US, India, and South Africa, uh, I'm told at very high levels, uh, which was facilitated by the Director General and the Deputy Director General in charge of intellectual property in the WTO. So this very high level uh, negotiations really developed on this idea of making compulsory licensing simpler and responding to the, the arguments that this is very difficult. Initially, the European Union had also made a proposal to make it easier in uh, June 2021. That proposal was also made as a counter to the waiver proposal. And essentially, the Quad process took the European Union proposal as the basis and then proceeded to see how the compulsory licensing existing in the TRIPS agreement, including for exports, could be made easier. So I'll stop here, Tulan, if you want to ask a further question. Yes, um, Yashri, I've heard that, you know, uh, the, the Quad, uh, discussions and plus what they, I call the support for this uh, proposal or solution was not very welcome by a number of countries or let's say the civil society constituency. Could you further expand on the reasons, uh, let's say more in detail, the reasons why they were opposing uh, this uh, compromise solution? or compromise presented by the Quad? So first, let me start by saying that eventually the final decision uh, is very close to the Quad text. However, there are some changes and that was in response to the criticism that uh, was made, uh, including by civil society, but also picked up of course, in the negotiations itself by some of the developing countries. So there was a proposal, there was a provision 
to list out all the patents uh, that uh, were to be subject to compulsory licensing. And this provision also already had a footnote in the Quad text which said that this paragraph is for further consideration, whether to keep or to delete. And eventually in the negotiations, this paragraph was deleted. The criticism made by civil society was it's very difficult to list out all the patents. There are hundreds of patents sometimes involved uh, behind a single vaccine or product and therefore this would be very, very hard. So that has been changed, it's been deleted. Mm -hmm. Another provision that's been, that was uh, really in uh, square brackets in the Quad text was with respect to the carving out of China. So uh, China, as many know, um, has, uh, an, uh, has probably the best capacity or is closest, I would say, to actually getting an mRNA-based vaccine for COVID-19. And uh, there was a concerted effort, particularly on the part of the United States, to uh, ensure that China is carved out of this decision. Now, China did not wa want to be carved out specifically or in any, uh, even in indirect terms, like, like uh, just pointing only to China. So language was developed and this went on to the very last um, the, the last hours of the ministerial decision where the negotiation between US and China resulted in compromise language where China's statement that it would not actually use this decision uh, as an exporter was really taken on board uh, the statement made in the general in the ministerial conference and in the general council was taken on board uh, and uh, and uh, will be actually recorded and will be binding uh, on China. So that was the compromise made in the end. Otherwise, the text is more or less what the Quad decided uh, to do, except one more change which I noticed is uh, the, the provision that refers to test data protection has actually been made stronger. So uh, it, that's my opinion, that it has been made stronger than the quad text. And maybe this has to do with pushback uh, from Switzerland and, and the United Kingdom. Mm. Okay, thank you for this clarification because I was wondering why Switzerland and UK oppose alongside with the, the African group but I guess for different reasons. So are you talking about the test data provision? Yes. Well, for developing countries, they wanted actually to also say that uh, trade secrets uh, are, uh, are waived in a certain sense, but that didn't happen, right? So with respect to test data, uh, the quad text said that nothing in the test data provision of the TRIPS agreement shall prevent a member, an eligible member from taking measures to make, um, to enable the effectiveness of any authorization made under this decision, words to that effect. Whereas the current text now says that it is understood that this provision of the TRIPS agreement does not prevent an eligible member from enabling rapid approval. So in a way, when you say it does not prevent, it's like a statement, it's like a factual statement. So it doesn't say it shall not prevent, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that, that I think is uh, the weakening of the language, uh, which I think was at the instance of those who wanted stronger intellectual property protection, notably, Switzerland and UK. Um, thank you. Uh, may I ask you another question on trade secrets because test data for me is quite clear, you know, in uh, relation to the text which has been proposed as a decision. But what about the pure trade secret or know-how which is linked to the invention? Um, in voluntary licensing, it is quite usual to have provisions concerning the know-how which is linked 
to the use of a patent, patented invention. Now, do you think it is quite, I mean, um, um, how to say, doable uh, to have, I mean, such a provision in a compulsory licensing where the licensor is obliged to give, let's say, what is the most important uh, in terms of the, the, the production, in terms of the use of his invention to, you know, in a, a mandatory way uh, to a person. Do you think, is it, well, I think it is not realistic to demand this. You can do that in voluntary licensing, but what about compulsory licensing? So this is perhaps something that members or negotiators might have them I mean, into uh, to give more thought. What do you think about? I mean, this, this is already in the past because uh, that is what uh, India and South Africa in their original proposal wanted, uh, the waiver of Article 39 entirely, which includes trade secrets as well as state protection. However, um, what would the waiver bring? Uh, you know, trade secrets really do not have the exclusive rights that patents have, right? It doesn't confer any exclusive rights. So anyone can actually make the same invention covered by a trade secret uh, if they arrive at it independently. All that trade secrets protection gives you is protection against acquisition of trade secrets through dishonest commercial means. Uh, so, which means theft. I mean, in other words, you know, you can't steal a trade secret or, uh, or acquire it uh, through, uh, through uh, dishonest means. So uh, you really can't compulsory license know-how or trade secrets. That's not even possible. So what the waiver would have done had such a waiver gone through on trade secrets would have been that those who wanted to steal trade secrets and were capable of doing that uh, would, could do it without any consequences in the WTO. That's the, uh, what it would have meant. But as we all know, uh, industrial espionage and uh, stealing of trade secrets is really not, uh, not a game that all countries play or are capable of playing. So it would have really meant only those who could actually reverse engineer and, uh, and, and use, uh, you know, discover or, or get to these trade secrets through, through unfair commercial means or dishonest means. So yes, we, we, we have dealt with in these negotiations and the decision of you know, the COVID-19 vaccines. So what is the next step, uh, you know, forcing? Um, what is the difference between the discussions and negotiation on vaccines and the ones on diagnostic and therapeutics and et cetera? Uh, it's, I think it's a more complex uh, area. So when this would happen and uh, what are the prospect, let's say, uh, we can make, you know, even in a very general way about these discussions. It took us so many years for the vaccine. So, so uh, in the quad text, it was mm -hmm. already agreed to between the four uh, that were around the table that no later than six months from the date of the decision, members will decide on an extension of this decision to cover the production and supply of COVID-19 diagnostics uh, and uh, therapeutics. So uh, that uh, language is exactly the same in the final decision. And uh, what it means is very shortly from now, uh, members of the WTO would have to gear up to discuss the extension of this decision to cover the production and supply of diagnostics and therapeutics. I will just say that uh, in the initial proposal made by South Africa and India, they really wanted it broader than just COVID-19 vaccines, diagnostic and therapeutics. They wanted to cover PPE kits and masks and ventilators and everything else that was needed if there was even any component of that patented, they would want 
they would have wanted all of that to be covered. However, the Quad negotiation seems to have narrowed that down to vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. And uh, as the US in May 2021 already indicated they were willing only to negotiate on vaccines, uh, this was narrowed down to vaccines in the Quad negotiations, which was uh, which the others were unable to reverse uh, when it was when it was presented to the general membership, uh, and and now uh, the extension to cover diagnostics and therapeutics is already narrow. Okay, it's only confined to therapeutics and diagnostics. Now, uh, that this is a more difficult discussion uh, is true in a way because unlike vaccines, especially vaccines based on mRNA, which are difficult um, and which everyone wants, uh, those are the only vaccines everyone wants because they are the most efficacious, uh, therapeutics, uh, which, are, which are some very good therapeutics have come out recently, from uh, from Pfizer, from Merck, those therapeutics uh, can uh, be uh, can be reverse engineered or compulsory licensing can be used for those. So uh, that has been now kept out of this decision, as well as diagnostics. However, uh, it's clear that existing flexibilities continue, which means Article Thirty One as well as Article 31 bis, uh, continue to apply. And any country that is capable of uh, and needs to issue a compulsory license for any of the therapeutics or diagnostics, even while there is no decision from the WTO, they can do so already. Uh, the problem, I mean, or I should not say problem, uh, but the fact is that in, in the case of both the Pfizer product, the Pfizer medicine, as well as the, the Merck medicine, both have been voluntarily licensed uh, through the medicines patent pool. And uh, about a large number of countries, I think about 35 countries are involved in the sub-licenses of this. So it's going to be produced quite widely, not immediately because it takes time. So it might come up uh, in, I mean, production might really start in 2023, which is next year. So I'm not sure that uh, it's going to be such a big issue in terms of availability, except in the immediate, in the immediate future, which of course nothing really can be done about, uh, even, even if you issued a compulsory license now, it would still take time to produce these therapeutics. Thank you so much, Yashri. Now I have uh, one question before I reach, I try to make some conclusions. The question is concerns um, the possibility for a country who do not use the waiver and, you know, try to, um, you know, sort of promote the protection of intellectual property rights in its own country. What this would give some comparative advantages to those who are making waiver or not? Well, just like all the so-called policy options in the TRIPS agreement uh, on access to medicines, this decision is also optional. So no country is forced to adopt any of the provisions in this decision, um, just like they are not forced to uh, adopt any of the other flexibilities available in the TRIPS agreement. Right. So uh, those that do, uh, you know, take advantage of this will only marginal have some marginal benefits in terms of, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'm also saying maybe there will be some marginal benefits in terms of compulsory licensing uh, procedures. Uh, and, you know, those that do not perceive uh, that there are any benefits from this decision compared to what they already have under Article 31, that is existing TRIPS agreement provisions in Article 31, including 31 bis, may uh, continue to adopt those procedures. So that's where I see uh, this going, you know, including in future negotiations on therapeutics and diagnostics. You know, countries will have a choice. Okay, thank you so much, Yashri. 
Uh, I would try now to to make some, let's say, uh, final comments. Um, I think apart from the fact that this decision came as a good surprise for the whole community of people dealing with intellectual property rights in the trading system. And we were so relieved. I think most of us were relieved. There might be some constituency who were not happy. Those others are not happy either. So it means that the compromise was some way in the midway and then the best thing we can reach. Um, somebody said something nice. It was, of course, uh, including with this fisheries, a bright day for the WTO and the multilateral trading system. And I think it's, it's quite nice after two, two years of COVID, two years of lack of communication and work, I think this came as a really a buffet there. It's the oxygen for, for the system. So um, I personally think it is a good, you know, achievement made. And uh, it's uh, thanks to the, um, the collective consensus and solidarity of all members. This is something I think is quite encouraging for the system. And I hope that they will continue to work with the same philosophy or approach. Um, I, I, if you, you have other suggestions to add to this conclusion, they are most welcome, Yashri. No, Tulang, I think you summed it up very nicely. Um, only those of us who know the details know that this doesn't amount to very much. <laughs> However, as you said, it's good for the system that they agreed to something on this and, and uh, you know, have partially closed this chapter. Of course, it continues with respect to therapeutics and diagnostics. Okay, I think to so this very positive and optimistic uh, conclusion from both of us, I think we can close this, this interview. Well, okay. Thank so, you. so Yashri, it was a pleasure to see you back through Zoom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye, Tula. Bye.